Hey everybody, welcome back to Dumbest in the Room podcast. I'm here today with someone who is not just my figurative hero, but my literal hero. I owe this man my life. He saved me when I was dealing with testicular cancer, and, and I'm so happy to have him. He is a uh, oncologist at Virginia Oncology Associates, and his name is Dr. Mark Fleming. Dr. Fleming, thanks for being here. Uh, thanks for having me. Good morning. Good morning. So before we, we talk about testicular cancer and everything, I want to know a little bit more about you. So tell me about where you grew up and how you got into oncology. Uh, well, I'm originally from Cleveland, Ohio. Um, I come from a healthcare family. My mother is a nurse. My father is a physician. Uh, and my oldest brother is also a physician. Um, uh, for many years, I didn't, I kind of, fought the family tradition of going into to healthcare. Um, but uh, when I started working for a, uh, an HMO, um, I was always envious of what doctors were talking to their patients or when they closed the door behind, though I had been in many medical offices, that kind of one-to-one -one relationship that physicians had with their patients. And it kind of led me down a path of kind of looking into being doing medicine because um, um, that kind of intrigued me and fascinated me. And um, so that's kind of led me down the path into medicine. Um, and throughout my medical career, um, I always enjoyed um, relationships with not only the patient, but also their family. And as you know, uh, I know mom and I know dad. Um, uh, I, I know girlfriend. Yeah. <laughs> um, and um, that is... Um, I think that's something that's unique to oncology because, uh, you know, a cancer diagnosis can affect all the people that uh, love that person and they want to do their part. So that's really what I love most about oncology is the fact that uh, um, the uh, confidence and, um, you know, that people put in me and it just everything you put in oncology, you get out of it. So it's, it's really rewarding. Um, from that standpoint, um, I know your mom's appreciative and, um, oh, yeah. she you, loves know, you. <laughs> <laughs> you know, um, um, I, I, I've met your, your wonderful uh, new girlfriend and it's, it's, uh, it's, it's nice to see that you had this diagnosis and we moved on. So I think that was the biggest thing that intrigued me to oncology was, was that relationship aspect. I've also fallen in love with, um, the science and trying to bring new treatments. Um, and, uh, so I, I, I like bringing new, uh, 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 therapies to the community. And I think I got that from my father that of trying to make sure that we do, uh, do it for our community. So my family will be, uh, Norfolkians, you know, this is, you know, uh, my wife and I were raising our family. We go to church and, uh, I, I like to dispel the myth that you have to go to some um, university medical center to get the best treatment. And I think you can do it here in our own community. That's awesome. So what um, age did you decide that you wanted to get into medicine? Because I see you went to uh, you went to the University of Pennsylvania and then you went to um, the University of Ohio. So, medical, yeah. Yeah. So um I, I um, so I had a detoured route to to uh, to medicine um, because uh, I was a little less focused than many of my colleagues when they went to college. They knew exactly they wanted to go to medical school. I toyed with the idea, um, but I, you know, I, I I got to understand myself and what I really enjoyed. So I had a little bit of detoured path um, uh, after uh, graduating from college. I needed to do some ad additional coursework uh, to to have a, a competitive application into medical school. So uh, the detour was self um, was self inflicted. Uh, something I try to tell my kids that you know I, I think in the end it was valuable. Uh, but I started medicine late. I think I was 29 when I started medical school. Um, um, uh, I think it did give me some great life experience, um, having worked in the business world, um, um, and quite frankly, realizing that I did not want to do the corporate America route. Um, um, 
you know, I, I, I have stories about, you know, not wanting to, uh, uh, of, of not wanting to uh, realizing that that wasn't my path and that was my destiny. Um, and I, one thing I like about medicine is that you can go as high as you want to. And so that's kind of led me there. Um, so I had a detoured route because self-inflicted in college, I didn't know what I want to do, but I think in the end uh, it was valuable and it helps explain uh, how I've come the, the doctor that I am as well as the uh, phys- um, physician leader, et cetera. So you mentioned going as high as you want to. You are uh, your bio said that you serve as the medical director of U.S. Oncology's genitourinary research committee, and you're also the president of Virginia Oncology. Is that correct? Well, I was the president. You were okay. Uh, I, I just completed my term. We usually have uh, a two-year term, and I completed that term uh, December 31st. Uh, I still am the medical director for the genitourinary program, which is essentially the uh, cancers of the genital urinary tract, which would include kidney, kidneys, bladder, uh, prostate, and testicles. So those are my areas of expertise um, and um, um, lead that program in terms of bringing um, treatments to the community. So U.S. Oncology is our parent or sister organization where um, you know, provides a lot of infrastructure support for Virginia Oncology Associates. Um, and one of those uh, support is research. And so we have a, have a, um, a, 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 a vigorous or vital um, research program. You know, I'm proud to say that, you know, you, uh, Virginia Oncology has been responsible for uh, multiple drug approvals. Um, uh, for example, uh, and my, me personally, you know, the first immunotherapy drug approved for bladder cancer, um, we we got a, we helped get approved. We accrued a lot of patients to that. In addition, for a drug called enzalutamide and prostate cancer, uh, um, we were involved with that as well as Cipolusal T for prostate cancer. And recently, we closed a study. We were the highest accruer for a, a novel. Uh, imaging study for prostate cancer. So to me, research is where it's at. Um, it's one thing to, you want to be able to provide your patients with the latest and greatest and ideally um, that they don't have to travel very far. So let's talk about the research. What what exactly goes into that? I mean, are you, you're not, are you in a lab or anything or you're doing, you're administering the drugs and, and watching the outcomes? Yeah. So clinical research, there's, there's, um, there's, um, there's um, f- physicians who do um, who work in the lab. Oftentimes, they'll have PhDs where they uh, combine the fact that they have a clinical background of taking care of patients with also looking at doing experiments to find patients to experiments to find r- new drugs, um, um, and that takes a lot of kind of the bench research. I, I focus in what's called clinical research uh, from phase one. Phase one research are the newest drugs. And so when phase one research, you're looking for the safe dose of a medicine. And then when you find a safe dose, you also find, is it, does it work? So we do both phase one as well as uh, through phase three testing. And phase three testing is uh, comparing a new drug to the standard of care to see which one is better. Oftentimes, uh, for all of those diseases, since there's many different drugs out there, it's usually adding something to. Um, so if you add a, uh, a new drug to a known combination, uh, for example, for testicular cancer, if we were to add something to uh, atopicide cisplatin, which is the standard of care, does adding something to that is beneficial. We wouldn't test out a new drug um, since um standard of care is so effective for many, many patients. So I, I love um, doing a research. Um, I've been blessed to um, to been a part of um, many new drug approvals, uh, first and first and man uh, new drug combinations. And it's just exciting. And again, it, to me, it gets back to my father's kind of being a community uh, primary care physician is um, you know, this is this is my community. Um, we want to bring the best to our community in terms of 
you don't have to go far away um, um, to to get the best treatment. Um, and so I'm just very committed to that. And when I was president of Virginia Oncology, we set out on a strategic plan. And part of that strategic plan, my vision was how do we become the best uh, community oncology practice in the country, and I think that we set off on a on a on a path that we could we could work towards that. And I think it's a process; it's not an endpoint. It's you know I just love the I love the journey. I love the destination. That's awesome, and I have no complaints about Virginia Oncology. So you you're doing a great job. Just a a question I have is as far as the drugs, um, the names of these. Who comes up with the names of these things? <laughs> Well, the, the, um, so most drug names are related to the class of which they work. So, um, for example, cisplatin and carboplatin, the fact that there's platinum, it goes to the science of, of the drug. And so the name kind of comes from, from the, and there's a, there's kind of a protocol that how those names are, are derived. The, so those are the quote generic names. Uh, the brand names, um, uh, drug companies try to get very um, 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 intriguing or very exciting in terms of how they name the drugs because they want patients to say, I want this, I want Keytruda, I want, I want Taxotere. Um, and so um, because usually there's a seven, light, seven year uh, patent for, for, for drugs, so then there can quote unquote be generics. Uh, what we're seeing now in, in oncology is what's called biosimilars. Uh, biosimilars are, are drugs um, that have been tested that are uh, shown to be as effic efficacious or at least definitely not inferior to the uh, brand drug, and but they come at uh, a less uh, a less less cost, and that's one of the things that we'll have to address as a society um, in terms of the cost of drugs. Um, so, um, depending upon how you think is healthcare right, what we want to do is make sure, especially in d diseases that are curable, we want to make sure that. Uh, we get access to those drugs and biosimilars is a way to help lower the cost, but it's still same time uh, ensuring um, quality and efficacy. So let's talk about cost. Um, it's not, you know, anybody can, can get cancer, unfortunately, and uh, not everybody is, is well off enough to afford these drugs. I mean, I know, I think my new Lasta that I got, which is, uh, you can probably explain it better than me, but um, I think that came up on my explanation of benefits as costing $16,000 per dose. So when somebody is not able to afford the treatment and they don't have insurance, what are they denied care or are you still, you still care for them? Uh, they still get cared for. Um, we, we, we find uh, means to, to get, to, to get care. Um, uh, drug companies will provide compassionate use of drugs um um you you know as a as a company we eat some of the costs of some drugs so we can't obviously do that in every single uh, uh case um we work with our hospital systems in terms of there's what's called 340b pricing and so they get funding from um from the government to be able to provide for um uh, drugs. Uh, um, many of the expensive drugs are oncology drugs, so they get pricing. They get a, they get kind of a, 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 a benefit and a bonus to provide these medications um, uh, from that standpoint. So, um, rarely, rarely um, is it a, a situation where we can't provide care um, uh, from that standpoint. Um, um, it's usually. Um, Sometimes I have to make adjustments on, on, on a drug that I would want to use um, uh, based upon costs or quite frankly, patients will tell me there's a financial toxicity. So, you, you know, we talk about the toxicity of, of drugs, the side effects, there's also a financial cost. And I think it's interesting as I've done this more and more, patients have said to me that, uh, you know, are there alternatives, you know, more cost effective alternatives. Gotcha. And speaking of alternatives, people like to uh, go to the, the, I don't even know what they're called. The, is it the Western or Eastern? I guess we're Western. So herbals and stuff. I mean, is that, does that show any kind of 
efficacy or are your drugs the the <laughs> your drugs yeah. the uh, pharmaceutical ones are those you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So yeah. So and, and there's a lot of um, there's a lot of lore. There's lots of myths out there. So what I usually say is that if if a patient asks me in terms of the efficacy, I can tell them um, pretty definitively on what the what the success rate of a drug is because there's been rigorous testing a about the safety. Um, and also the efficacy of the drug. And so there's usually a numerator to that um, efficacy and there's a denominator, so which works out to be a percentage. So I get this question asked so many times that what, I mean, if I have a piece of paper around here, uh, you know, I kind of put, you know, why well, hear this drug works? And so I say, great, so I put X, it, it works, and so it works in X amount of people. Um, and I'll ask the patient, you know, do you know, you know, but my friend Bob, it worked. I said, great. Well, do we know how many people it didn't work? Right. But I know it worked in Bob. And I said, well, that is, you know, that's telling me the numerator, but I need to know the denominator. And my job and my belief uh, is that my job is to give people the what's the most likely effective scenarios um, of, in, in terms of treating your disease. Um, and as long as an herbal company or what, whatever, any drug that you bring to me, I'm willing to try as long as I know we can have a good sense of what the efficacy is uh, from that standpoint. So we balance uh, efficacy and side effects. Um, and so, um, and it's a, I mean, you know, my style, it's, it's, it's a negotiation. Yeah. Um, I, I, my, I am not paternalistic from, from the sense of, I don't tell people what to do. I really try to give my patients options. And at the end of the day, we, we make some choices together. Right. Um, okay. So the, for the cost of drugs back to that, um, it's, are they, are the costs high because of corporate greed, so to say, or is it because of all of the research that goes into it? Well, that's a loaded question. Um, I think that, um, you know, pharmaceutical companies, um, for every drug that they study, they have for everyone that makes it, they probably have a hundred to 500 to, that don't make it. So right. you, you, you know, you, you are basically financing investment from that perspective. And then there's the marketing costs. You know, I, I think that pharmaceutical companies aren't the bad guy. Um, I think that, um, I, I think we need a more comprehensive approach in terms of how that's to be done. Um, you know, if you, asked me this question when I was a college student, I would have probably written about, I, I wrote about, I should say, um, you know, um, national health care um, uh, from that perspective. Um, but it's a difficult thing given our, you know, our, our, our culture of, uh, of how do we make um, health care more affordable and accessible. Um, I, I was there was a book that I read when I was in uh, uh, an undergraduate. It's called Who Shall Live? It was a great book. And basically, there's three issues that come into healthcare. One is access, one is quality, and one is cost. And so um, you, are, you have to balance those things. If you go too much towards cost, that all we want the, the cheapest thing, well, that's going to impact access and it's going to impact uh, quality. And so it's trying to find the right balance of, of how do you balance that? Um, and it's not an easy thing to do um, uh, from that standpoint. Right. All right. So let's get into uh, what you, what it is that you do as a, what would your title be? Genito urinary. I can't even say it. Genito. Well, urinary. Yeah. Genito urinary. So, you know, at this point in, in 2021, uh, you know, to bring, an earlier conversation full circle, you know, as a practice of Virginia Oncology Associates, we made the decision that 
we need to become more what's called subspecialized. So I rarely take on new breast cancer patients now because I don't do enough breast cancer to stay current in the latest and greatest in breast cancer. You specifically or Virginia Oncology as a whole? Me specifically. Okay, gotcha. So I don't take care of breast cancer, I, new breast cancer patients. Um, so, um, and so we're moving in a direction of sp- subspecialization. That's a nice thing about being big enough that I, t- I know how to manage and how to treat testicular cancer patients and the complexities and the subtleties. And I think when you get subspecialization, that's what you kind of, kind of get. So, um, so I'm a GU specialist, prostate, bladder, kidney, um, testicular. Um, I just see a lot of it. And I would probably say 90% of my practice or probably fair to say 90% of my new patients fall within those four diseases. Because when you initially start out, you, you're just trying to get, um, you know, you know, see patients, see everything. Um, but, but now um, more and more so, I do more so that. So a GU specialist f- focuses in those areas. Okay, so you are you have those specialties. So what? Let's talk about the statistics of of each one, and we'll end with testicular, and that'll segue us into my story. But um, you know, obviously, you don't want to have any patients, but you don't want anybody to have cancer, but you do want to treat these people who do. So let's start with um, bladder and and talk about the statistics for that. Well, I, I would say oncology or cancer in general is usually a disease of the aging. So as we get older, there are more mutations. There's more things that happen that um, that can lead someone to developing uh, a cancer. Testicular, we'll, we'll finish with that last. So bladder cancer um, is um, – um, not the most common. It's probably in the top 10. Uh, I think of bladder cancer as what we call urothelial cancer. Urothelial cancer is anything that comes in contact with the urine. What cancer really is, is what cells are now that started out one way have become abnormal and have mutated and they, they try to survive and, and um, persist. So for bladder cancer, we know there's some clear risk factors. Smoking is a clear risk factor um, for developing bladder cancer, and you are more likely developing to develop bladder cancer if you are a smoker. Um, so, um, um, in terms of statistics, uh, you know, I want to say uh, bladder cancer is in the top 10 percent um, in terms of uh, of cancers that exist. Um, a little bit more predominant in men than women. And again, it probably goes back to the, the smoking history. Gotcha. All right. Now uh, let's do the same for kidney and then prostate. So kidney cancer. Kidney cancer is usually um, from the, um, the urine producing cells uh, in the kidney. So there's the main types of kidney cancer, are what we call clear cell. Uh, the other most common type is what's called papillary kidney cancer, also known as renal cell cancer. Uh, it's known as the incidental loma or the uh, oftentimes kidney cancer is found incidentally. You know, someone goes to their doctor and says, you know, I've been having um, this stomach pain and they check a picture and, oh, wow, there's a big kidney mass. The other thing that we see uh, for uh, uh, a symptom of kidney cancer is blood in someone's urine. So blood in your urine is never normal. Um, um, and so um, anytime someone gets blood in their urine, that is an abnormal finding and they should be seen and evaluated by their doctor. It could be something like a inflammation. It could be, um, it could be an infection or it could be something even more serious than that, uh, such as a cancer. Um, um, and kidney cancer, uh, there is a, genetic relationship to some kidney cancers, what's called von Hippel-Landau syndrome. There's some other um, syndromes that we can see with kidney cancer. Um, um, uh, And for patients with kidney cancers or family histories, oftentimes I'll refer people for what's called genetic counseling, but that happens to be less than 5% of the time um, from that perspective. So um, 
and kidney cancer um, is treated. Uh, chemotherapy does not work in kidney cancer. Um, we've tried every, quote, chemotherapy, but immunotherapy and what's called targeted therapy, um, we're getting much better in terms of our treatment, um, uh, is quite effective. But kidney cancer, if it has not spread, uh, the initial treatment is um, uh, surgery um, um, for kidney cancer. What's the difference between immunotherapy and, and chemotherapy? So uh, chemotherapy um, is, it works by um, cells grow in our body. We all have cells now growing and, and dying and they do, they have a natural lifespan um, um, and uh, what's called apto aptosis. And in that life, life cycle, sometimes um, it gets off the beaten path and those cells will begin to mutate. Chemotherapy typically will uh, impact cell growth in some way, um, um, where the cells divide, the, the, the way they replicate. And so chemotherapy broadly hits new uh, rapidly dividing cells. Cancer cells tend to rapidly divide more so than regular cells. And so that's the thought of chemotherapy is treating those rapidly dividing cells. The side effects from chemotherapy typically relate to those cells and the impact of those cells dying or not having enough of. And so for the type of treatment that you receive, your blood counts are affected, your red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets can be affected, but specifically the type of chemotherapy that's used in testicular cancer. Immunotherapy works very differently than that. In immunotherapy, and this is an oversimplification, it works by cancer cells have the ability to shut off our immune system, and these medicines block our immune system from being shut off, which is, allows our immune system to fight cancer cells. Hmm. And it's, it's just dramatic, some of the responses that we've seen uh, with immunotherapy. So the side effects are totally different than chemotherapy. I typically quote about less than 5% of patients can have uh, serious side effects related to immunotherapy, and I describe them as what, what's called autoimmune side effects. So your immune system was being blocked or shut off by the, immune, by, by the cancer cells. We now block that, allowing our immune system to now work, but our immune system is working so well, it can attack our own body, and mm -hmm. we can see side effects related to it. And I've literally seen, I treat a lot of with a lot of patients with immunotherapy, which is basically become standard of care for advanced kidney cancer, for advanced bladder cancer. Um, um, I've seen every autoimmune side effect to skin, to brain, to thyroid, to liver, to lung, usually responds very well with steroids, which suppresses our immune system. But... Um, um, but usually if you have these side effects, um, means you have to stop the treatment. Oh, wow. Is there a day where one might, where immunotherapy might take over for chemotherapy or? I, I think we're in that process. I think we're, we're using it more and more. Um, yeah. um, I think there will always be a role for chemotherapy. I have many patients who, you know, don't want to do quote chemotherapy. Um, but you, sometimes you can't throw out the baby with the bathwater. Um, chemotherapy has its role. Um, um, and, but it's nice to have options and it's been groundbreaking in bladder cancer. It's been groundbreaking in kidney cancer. Um, uh, from that standpoint, um, I have a patient who was on the initial study, uh, for one of the drugs, uh, for bladder cancer. He had metastatic or stage four disease and i think he's probably out four four and a half years out and when we check pictures we can't find disease i don't say cure um, um i don't say remission but all i know is when i see him um i know that his he he's cancer free uh, i can't find any active cancer cells by our imaging techniques and he's um um he did have an autoimmune side effect related to it. That was like three years in, but he's been off therapy for at least a year and still, still doing, um, still doing great. That's awesome. And that, that's, you know, that's, yeah, that, that is awesome. I know it was in a clinical trial. Wow. 
That's great. So he got the drug approximately 18 months before the drug was approved. And so I think he's alive today because he participated in a clinical trial. Are those trials the same kind of thing we've seen with the vaccines that are happening now? Um, what, I don't know what you mean by what's happening in vaccines now. The way with with the coronavirus vaccines we've had, um, they've kind of done, the, they did the phases. It's the same thing for, okay. Yep, yeah, all drugs that are approved work through those phases. Uh, there's, uh, there's really technically four phases. Phase one is what's the safe dose. Phase two, ask the question, is it effective? You ideally want to get part of that question answered in a phase one trial. So phase two, is this drug effective? And in phase three, is the drug more effective than the standard of care? Um, and phase four is drug is approved and doing post surveillance of making sure anything doesn't come up that wasn't found in the subset of patients that were treated during the clinical trial. So with the vaccines, and I'm not totally up to date with the vaccines in terms of the phases, but if there was no standard of care, there was no coronavirus vaccine. Right. So they really wasn't, quote, a phase three that they were comparing it to. It might have been compared to placebo. And so the way that you figure out, does this vaccine work, is some people get it, some people don't, and do people not get as infected as much. And you really have to go to that rigorous testing to find out whether a drug works or not, as well as, is it safe? And so... It can be very frustrating how long it takes, um, but that's really kind of the the way to do it because sometimes you can get a signal early on because you can you can, for lack of a better term, cherry pick patients. You know those well fit patients, for example. Let's go to your question of the vaccines. Well, vaccines weren't tested in patients with cancer, and so I get at least five questions a day at least that was going to be my next uh, question <laughs> uh, should i get the vaccine well part of me has to do the disclaimer well i don't know we don't know it are vaccines they've never been quote tested in patients with cancer so well then i have had them tested i don't want to know but then i say well though everything comes with risks and benefits the benefit of the vaccine is it can decrease the likelihood of you developing COVID-19 where people are dying from, from COVID-19. And is that benefit outweigh the risk of, it hasn't formally been studied. As far as we can tell, it's safe. Um, and so I'm encouraging my patients uh, that it is something for them to consider. Uh, short of recommendation, because a recommendation, well, you told me to do that. You know, what I do is I try to lay out that the risks of you getting COVID-19 um, are, and the concerns of that infection probably outweigh the potential risks of getting the, the, getting the vaccine. Right, because like you were saying, the immune system is either suppressed or turned off. So I guess your patients would be more susceptible to catching it. That's the thought. Yes. Interesting. All right. So um, back on the on the um, topic of chemotherapy, I know there's IV chemo, and then some people get um, by mouth. It's just a way. It's it's just a a. a f pharmacology formulation of how it can be given. So to me, at the end of the day, it's how it works. So there are some oral chemotherapies um, and there are some chemotherapies we need to give through the IV. For example, you can take atoposide, a drug that you received, um, 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 orally, but it's a, it's a whole lot of pills to take, so it's just easier to infuse IV. Yeah. Gotcha. All right, let's move on to prostate cancer. And this one I know from seeing the uh, infographics in your office affects um, African-Americans more than anyone else. And uh, anecdotally, I know that because four people that I work with have had prostate cancer and three of them are African-American. So why, is, why would that be the case? We don't know why. Um, we don't know the why. And so when a doctor says they don't know the why, there's no clear data. So um, 
you know, and I think that answer frustrates people because we're so used to being able to, there has to be a reason, but part of it is that, um, and there's actually a clinical trial going on trying to understand the, the genetic condition of African-American patients with prostate cancer and without, and it requires people to participate in that, uh, uh, that clinical trial. You're going to ask me, and I don't know the answer to that tr trial, but I'm going to get it to you um, later, but that you can give to your to people on your blog. But um, um, we don't know the exact answer. Uh, I'm a very practical person, and so I actually lost my father to prostate cancer, who's, who's my hero, uh, always be my hero. Um, and um, so knowing that that my father had it, i.e. a genetic uh, potential predisposition, I'm African-American, then I take matters into my own hands and I say, hey, I want to get tested and do everything that I w can do to decrease the likelihood of developing uh, prostate cancer. And the way you do that is with early detection. Early detection of prostate cancer is uh, being informed. It's getting a digital rectal exam. Um, and it's also um, getting a blood PSA test. It's not one of those things. It's all three of those things in order to, to advocate for yourself um, and to, to, to prevent that from happening or being aware when it happens to catch it earlier. And I think one of the basic pr principles is cancer that is caught earlier, um, um, we have better outcomes than when cancer is found in later stages. What are the signs and symptoms, if any, of, of prostate cancer? That's a great question, and the, there, there are none. So there are no, quote, signs and symptoms of an early stage prostate cancer when it's most curable. Unfortunately, there are signs and symptoms of prostate cancer when it becomes advanced um, and is spread. What is the typical age for somebody to be screened without any family history? And then if family history. So you use a word that I did not use. I did not use the word screened. So I'm glad that you brought it up. Um, so I don't believe in screening for prostate cancer. I believe in the early detection of prostate cancer. Okay. Early detection looks at, and I think, it's a very subtle difference, but we need to get the word screening out it, because people have to be proactive in their healthcare. So um, you need a digital rectal exam, you need PSA testing, and you need to be informed. And to me, that's early detection to find cancers early. Screening takes a, a general population and just doing some tests and seeing if that helps. And it's very controversial if that helps with just PSA testing alone. To get back to your question, I usually some, say as someone with quote, average risk disease, that it'd be reasonable to start begin testing at about age 45 um, for average risk uh, for prostate cancer. You have high risk of developing prostate cancer or higher risk if you're African American or you have a family history. So I have the double whammy uh, because I'm African American and I, my father had prostate cancer. So I'm not average risk, I'm at higher risk. And I usually say when someone who has a higher risk of prostate cancer that it would be appropriate to begin the early detection of prostate cancer at age 40. Gotcha. All right, let's move on to uh, last, but certainly not least, um, testicular cancer. Um, so let's, we'll start with you given the statistics and then we'll get into your, yours and my relationship. Yeah, so testicular cancer is the most common uh, cancer in uh, men age less than 40. Um, um, and testicular cancer, the good news, it is highly, highly curable. Um, um, from that standpoint, even if the disease has spread, uh, typically presents with a palpable testicular mass. Um, it very rarely does not present with a testicular mass. Um, and so having a mass or feeling something in your testicle is not normal, and you should get it checked out. Um, actually, a very good friend of mine uh, this week um, I won't say our association, but he was concerned. And I was like, hey, you need to go get 
you need to get tested uh, for that. The preliminary findings are it does not appear to be a testicular cancer, which is is good. Yeah. Um, so, um, um, so um, the most common uh, cancer in a man under the age of, of 40, and um, that's the typical side effect. I've seen people ignore it, um, ignore the mass um, for months and years. Um, Myself I included. Actually, <laughs> Um, you know, it's a, it's a scary thing what are the possibilities. Um, and so, you know, I've seen testicular masses gr- to the size of grapefruits um, and, you know, that they were walking around um, and they were just afraid to get it tested out. It didn't hurt. And so if it didn't hurt, I'm still able to do uh, the things people still might do go on. But a mass, a new mass is not normal. So about the masses. So I know I've heard people have lumps on the outside. Um, as far as I'm aware, mine was on the inside because I didn't feel necessarily a mass on the outside. It was just that my left testicle over the course of two and a half years that I should not have let it go on was getting more and more tender and larger. Yes. So, yeah, so it can vary. So tenderness, uh, uh, pain, Pain that doesn't go away, um, you know, uh, you know that I like to play golf, you know, um, when, um, if I play golf, you know, and um, I might be sore afterwards, but I shouldn't be sore two or three weeks after playing golf. And if, you know, people can't ignore what their body is telling them, pain, soreness is there's something going on and needs to be, needs to get checked out. And going back to early detection, um, I was lucky, I guess, with mine that for letting it go on for two and a half years, it it only metastasized to one spot. But I, as we both know, we know someone who it seems that his head was more aggressive and and a short amount of time spread more places. So that leads me to talk about um, the different types of, I know there's seminoma and non-seminoma and teratoma. Yeah, so there's two broad categories of testicular cancer. One's called non-seminoma and one's called seminoma. Um, And so um, non-seminoma really encompasses many different types of, if you think about the genetic, that what the testicle does is it houses genetic material. And um, non-seminomas really encompass more, um, more of the, of uh, the genetic spectrum. Uh, so teratoma is, I call it the building blocks of the body, embryonal. There's different subtypes of non-seminoma. Semin- uh, uh, seminoma uh, is a specific type. They have a better prognosis um, uh, than does, quote, non-seminoma. And when we treat testicular cancer, we divide men into, um, if the cancer has spread, what's called good risk disease, intermediate risk disease, and in the case of non-seminoma, there's poor risk or bad risk disease. And that's really determined by uh, tumor markers. There's three tumor markers that are important for testicular cancer. One's called alpha fetoprotein, the other one beta HCG, and the last one LDH. And it's really probably more prognostic. What's more important is the level of someone's tumor markers less so where the cancer spreads to. For example, someone who has metastasis to their lung or, quote, stage four, people think of as stage four testicular cancer, um, but if their tumor markers are less elevated, um, they still likely will have a curable disease, um, but their prognosis is probably term- determined more by the fact that their tumor markers are elevated. So if someone can have disease that didn't spread to their lungs and just in the lymph nodes in the back of their belly, but if their tumor markers are markedly elevated, they might do worse uh, from that standpoint. In my case, I, I, you can correct me if I'm wrong if you remember, but I think I had non-seminoma because mine was mixed. Um, correct. And I, I think mine was like 5% teratoma. And it, teratoma Correct. interests me because my girlfriend has a nursing student. She's had an oncology class. And teratoma can grow like teeth and hair. Correct. 
Yeah. So it's again, it it houses the 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 genetic components of what becomes what I call the building blocks of the body. So that would be you know bone, teeth, hair, and yes, we we've seen that at sites of metastasis. Rare, we see it less and less these days, but yes, you can see it. That's crazy to me, but kind of cool <laughs> for what it is. Um, so. I had etoposide and cisplatin, as we've mentioned, but I know there's also a, a third one, um, bleomycin. There's actually more so than that. So there's 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 different regimens. So um, there's bleomycin, etoposide, cisplatin, which we call BEP, um, and there's also EP, etoposide, cisplatin. And for someone with quote good risk disease. Um, you can either give four four cycles of etoposide cisplatin or three cycles of bleomycin etoposide cisplatin. One does not work better than the other. So in terms of the efficacy, um, they work equally as well, but they have different side effects. And it's a friendly debate of our three cycles of BEP. Bleomycin can have a, a, a unique set of side effects which is called lung toxicity and what's called Raynaud's phenomenon, which, which is unique to bleomycin. And, you know, as I talk with you and your family, when you were diagnosed is my expectation is what is Stephen Crocker going to be doing 10 years from now? Stephen Crocker doing 30 years from now. And so you have to think of what are the long term effects of a disease that we are likely to cure. And so you have to, balance that in the treatment. And so that's what's, I guess, the fun part of, of taking care of young testicular care, cancer patients is, I met you before, girlfriend, and life different afterwards. And life on this side is much, much better. I had to take you through a rough period of time to get to the point where you're now doing blog, uh, blog um, webcasts and you're doing these type of things, you're going on with your life. Uh, your hair came back, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and that's the, I mean, that's the rewarding aspect of what I do is that, you know, I knew it would be rough. Um, and typically people are younger. You've had to deal with, deal with things that most 20 something year olds haven't had to deal with. And um, that's, you know, looking at their mortality. I mean, it's, you know, will I make it through this? And that's, and you've had to have surgery and it's just, it's just a, um, it's a difficult time, but I, I think that's the rewarding thing is I'm seeing the, 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 not the new Steven, it's this, uh, the evolved Steven. Right. And, uh, you mentioned, you've mentioned my parents before, and I just want to say that they are huge fans of you as well. Um, and, you talked about treating me, you know, how I'm going to be in 20 years and 30 years, which brings me to another point, treating the, uh, treating the patient versus treating the disease. What's the, the balance of that? Well, I think it brings our, you know, our, our conversation full circle. Um, um, I think for me, and I can only speak for myself, for me, what I went into medicine for, was I the ability to connect with 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 patients and uh, I, I like to think that I explain things relatively well. I can put things in simple terms. You're great at analogies. Um, I remember uh, the Coke versus Pepsi. <laughs> <laughs> um, so um, so my appeal to medicine was to how can I help people? Um, you know that rewarding aspect. Um, uh, I was. I was successful before, um, you know, in my, my prior life, my pre-medicine life. Um, I probably, if I would have headed down that path, I'd probably be working for some HMO or some hospital or something like that. Uh, while that is rewarding, I wanted that more direct uh, kind of connection. Um, and so that's the appealing thing. So for me, um, I think the fact that I took a detoured route to medicine, it probably helped. It probably helped me understanding myself better, and also understanding of what I think, what I saw being a non-physician, non in that path of heading towards a physician. That what's important to people, and um, what's important to people is 
is my little Steven going to be, is he still going to be okay? And yes, mom, he's going to be okay. Um, and you know, and you, you know, I adore your mom as, as well, that all she was looking at is the same way my wife looks at her kids and is like, you, you can't do enough, no matter how old that we get. My mother still worries about me. It's, yeah. it's that just that paternal or maternal instincts of, of, you know, you'd rather have it, it, you'd rather be it on yourself than on your child. And so, you know, mom, it's easier for you to call me and text me than you stay up all night worrying about what's going on. It's just, it's just easier. It's just, you know, and, you know, uh, I very rarely have patients abuse that. Um, you have my cell phone number and your I mother. I feel like I abuse it. Phone. I feel like I text you too much. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, it's, it's, and you know, my family understands that that's who, who daddy is. This is what daddy does. And, um, I think that, you know, my, 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 I know my dad was very proud of me and my mom and my, my brothers and, uh, you know, my family understands that this is who I am and this is important to me. And, um, um, you know, what makes daddy tick and my daughter being 14, um, uh, you know, I think she's thinking it's a little bit cooler now that her dad's a doctor, you know, um, you know, as cool as a dad can be when your daughter's 14. Yeah. And I mean, which is not very cool. <laughs> um, yeah. Your bedside manner is, is incredible. I mean, I remember my first appointment with you, um, after my urologist, Dr. Lambert referred me, um, my mom had a, you probably remember a page and a half of questions and you said, let me see that. And you took the paper and you went through and you answered every single one, one by one. So, I mean, that's, yeah. that's pretty incredible. And you definitely, you take the time and, uh, that's awesome. I mean, any patient that, that has you, despite having the worst news of their life, well, you're very pres kind. presumably they're lucky to have you. Uh, it's, it's, I, 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 I feel blessed to, to let people that let me into their, uh, and their, the, again, it, you know, it's, uh, it's, it's very rewarding. It's very humbling that people put their confidence in me. And I, I, I take that very seriously. You do great at it. And I, I don't want to end on a bad note, but on the flip side of that coin, when somebody does not have a, uh, a great prognosis. How does that affect you as a physician and well, as a person? I think you, you know, I think that, uh, it's, uh, it's how you look at things. And, um, yes, I give news that, and I'm very direct with patients that, you know, you have a disease I can't cure you of. Um, um, I saw my doctor today, so I, I'm a patient as well. And, you know, you want to, uh, prepare people for, for things, but doesn't mean he doesn't stop living. Um, you know, um, you, you basically, um, try to balance the quality of life with the quantity of life. So we basically want to live. We all define quality different. Um, that's one of the things that I've learned. Um, but, um, and I think it's important to have conversations with, um, you know, with your patients and also people need to have that conversation. What's important to them? Um, um, you know, what's important to me right now is my family. You know, I want to do whatever it takes to um, uh, be to, you know, at the end of the day, it's all about our family. And, um, you know, I, I want to be there to see my kids grow up. I want to uh, be there and not work so much. And my wife finally get to enjoy my company, um, which fully focused on her uh, and uh, enjoy our, uh, we raised a wonderful ki two kids together. And then, you know, what are we going to do long-term uh, things that we enjoy uh, from that perspective? So, um, but the victory can always be, um, you know, remission or cure and things like that, because unfortunately the reality, that's not going to be the case. And I find that um, people that embrace that um, this chapter in their life uh, doesn't necessarily have to define their life, uh, their cancer. It's a chapter, um, you know, 
me being an oncologist, it's just part of who I am. It doesn't, it's not everything that I do. And, you know, just, um, it's the simple things. And I think that, and you probably have a better perspective than most, uh, is that the simple things, you know, playing with the dog, um, going on the beach, uh, being in love. It's the, you know, the, you appreciate things more. Yeah. And sometimes you don't sweat the small stuff like you, you used to. Yeah, I think and understand you, that you understand that you, you you we try to manage so many things. Some things we just can't manage and can't control. Yeah. Well, another thing I remember from the first uh, appointment I had with you is you said, "I am going to." I don't remember if you said you're going to cure me of this disease. Disease. I think you probably did because you knew my prognosis was good. But you said I'm going to see your name at the end of a movie, and that's part of why I'm I'm doing this podcast. And you know. I feel like, like you were saying, young and facing mortality. I feel like, you know, if this podcast is not successful or if any of my shows that I pitch aren't successful, I know that I'd rather try and fail because I have the opportunity than not try at all. Right. And I well, hopefully you'll become uh, you. You'll get into Marvel because I'm a big Marvel guy, and you'll 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 produce some Marvel movie or something like that. Then I can go to opening night. Yeah, well, hey, if that if that happens, <laughs> you are my uh, you'll be my red carpet date for sure. <laughs> you'll be my plus one. Uh, and just you know, thank you again so much for for taking the time and and you know spending this last hour with me. I know that you are a busy guy, and uh, I don't take it lightly that you have carved out an hour of your day for this interview. My pleasure, and. Uh, um, you know, uh, anything I can do to help and, uh, uh, much success. And, uh, I look forward to seeing your name at the end of that movie. Thank you. And one last thing, you might not have it right now, but my mom told me to ask and I have to ask for her. She wants to know if you have my numbers from yesterday's blood, <laughs> blood work. I haven't gone, I haven't gone through labs yet today. It's all good. She, I, I told her I would ask, but it's all good. <laughs> Thank you again. <laughs> I'll, 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 I'll get back to you. I have a couple of homework assignments for you. All right, cool. Thanks again. All right, thank you. Thank you.